I've got a question. Given the quality of electric cars, what could possibly be the excuse for buying a petrol and diesel vehicle if you've got the money? Welcome to The Climate Show. And this week, a first birthday. A bit sad, this. It's a year since I've had my electric car. In that time, I've done 20,000 miles and it's been almost completely problem free. I will accept there's a quite high upfront cost, but aside from that, I'm perplexed why many people are still so hostile to them. I'm gonna get on the road and find out. Also on the show, as the North Sea faces record-breaking heat, we're on the Isle of May to hear about the impact on marine life. And as it's Glastonbury this weekend, we'll show you how this turbine is serving up breezy burritos. So, electric cars. More of them are being sold. I love mine, but plenty of people still have their doubts. One advantage, you can plug it in at home. Not many people have a petrol pump at their house. So why are some people still holding back on making the switch? I'll take you through what it's like to own one and ask those who remain unconvinced what it would take. I've charged up at home for the trip as I have off-street parking, like two-thirds of households in this country. Electricity bills have gone up a lot recently, but it's still cheaper than the pump and much more so if you can generate your own. I am lucky enough to have solar panels, which makes the electricity for my car both cheaper and greener. But the cost of charging isn't the only price hurdle. This car costs just over 40,000 nearly new. I accept that's out of reach of many. Electric vehicles cost on average just over a third more than similarly specced petrol or diesel ones. But if money's not an issue, is it still acceptable to buy a pricey new petrol instead? I'm just arriving at the spot where we've arranged to meet our owner of a pricey gas guzzler. Somewhere he chose, it's a golf club. Even if I couldn't see him, I could hear him coming. Jason is as fond of his car as I am of mine. So, cost is clearly not a problem for you if it came to buying an electric car? No, no it's not. No, I think if it's the right car, no it's definitely not. So what is it that puts you off? I think for me, they're still a little unemotive. Um, boring? Not necessarily that it's boring, but it's a different type. It doesn't necessarily, you know, I think part of it is noise, it always has been. Given that we are in essence, talking about, well, the fate of human civilization in the face of climate change. Is fun a good enough reason to still be driving here? <laughs> well, I'd ask the same question back regarding any kind of adrenaline sports or things like that. For me, this is a little piece of heaven that I get to enjoy. Um, you know, I don't, do a, I, say, I don't do a significant amount of mileage, so it's not that I'm going through four to five hundred pounds of fuel in a month. You know, uh, so, so, so for me, I think this was my little guilty pleasure. It's nice to have a look at what will be a museum piece rather than sit on the future. Absolutely. Back on the road, let's talk about range anxiety. Another fear for drivers making the switch. This vehicle will do either side of 250 miles, depending on the weather and how fast you drive. So put simply, if it was very cold and you were motorway driving, you might get down to near a 200 miles range. If it was weather like this and you're on A roads, I've had 300 out of it. Given the need for safety and brakes, this seems very acceptable. After all, in 2021, 61% of all car journeys were less than five miles. Flipping over can also shrink our carbon footprint. The 20,000 miles I've done in this car in a year would have resulted in four tonnes of CO2 being emitted. And while construction emissions are higher than for traditional cars, that's more than made up for by zero emission driving. We're in London now, and one of the advantages of electric cars is that you don't have to pay the congestion charge. 
Also one of the ways in which electric car drivers could rightly be accused of being a bit smug. I'm here to visit the new car awards to ask about the prevailing mood in the industry over EVs. Still a buzz or gone flat? Given the quality of electric cars now, is it really immoral for wealthy people to buy internal combustion engine cars? I think the short answer to that question is no, it's not amoral. I mean, wow, who thought we'd be talking about morality when it came to cars, but electric means we're kind of at that point, right? Um, I don't think it is amoral for wealthy people to buy ICE cars. I think that we have an issue, which is that electric cars are really expensive and manufacturers can't bring the prices down anymore because there's no profit margins in them. So your point is that electric cars are currently subsidised by, well, I don't know, cars like this, big, big uh, internal combustion engine cars that, that cost a lot. They make more margin on them. They do. And so I think at the moment, while we're still trying to make that transition to mass adoption of electric cars, we need those wealthy buyers to come forward and help fund that, help fund the research. There's still a lot of research to be doing in making batteries better. We need that input. When it comes to these other things, you know, cost of running, range anxiety, charging infrastructure, where do you think we are with that? I mean, do you think any of those give a good reason for not giving an electric car? At the moment, the public charging network isn't where it needs to be. We know that. There are about 40,000 chargers on the roads. We need way more than that before we reach 2030. That is a big concern. It's probably a very real one. But a lot more of these concerns actually are perception versus reality. So people think that the batteries are going to degrade. People think that the range isn't going to be enough. And actually, if you speak to EV owners after a period of ownership, they haven't found many of those worries have been realised. I need to charge up myself before the drive back home. Are those fears well founded? So I found a charger and it is delivering the electricity successfully, but there can be some irritations with these things. One thing, it's very difficult to see how much you'll be paying for the electricity, and that's completely different from most garages where the petrol and diesel prices are clearly displayed. Another thing, it can, with some chargers, be difficult to get to pay. You need to have a special card or you need to preload an app. And sometimes the sort of stuff computer says no. To be fair, this has worked pretty well today. And then the speed of charging can vary. I have to open my door just to uh, get it to register. This says it's charging at 68, 69 kilowatts. That's pretty quick. It'll take 12 minutes to get to 80% of my battery. That's not bad. Just time to sneak in some cheeky road food. Refueled, it's time to go home. Whether you're a true EV convert or still on the fence, the window for choice is rapidly closing, with a ban on new petrol and diesel cars just six and a half years away. There's only one direction of travel. With that deadline looming though, it's not just about public acceptance, it's also about the materials to make the vehicles and all the other electronics which is expanding in our world. And to talk about that, I'm joined by Sky's economics editor, Ed Conway, who knows all about this and has brought some props. Love a prop. Yeah. Let's just start with the cars, and obviously lithium is the one that people talk about. How much, where does it come from, where are we with that? Lithium, uh, which we have here, it comes out of the ground uh, in various places. That stuff is actually from the UK, so that's from Cornwall. Okay. It's, it's, it's a place called British lith Lithium. It's lithium carbonates, that's why it's the kind of, you right. know... It, it, it's so we can extract it here. Grains of it. We can extract it here, and there are big plans afoot to do that. Um, but the vast majority of it comes from either Chile or Australia, and we are mining more and more of it. Um, the issue is, like, we've only just started working out how to do it. Like, you know, all of the other kind of materials that, that we tend to use, we've got a long history, mm. hundreds of years, thousands of years in some cases of mining them. Well, lithium, we just don't really, you know, no, we still haven't got the full knack of it. So getting it out of the ground is still a bit of a challenge. There's a lot of talk about its environmental impact and despoiling the places where it's extracted. Is, does it kind of have to be like that, do you think? Or is that just because we're in the early stages? Well, it's just, <laughs> it's just hard to think of anything that we get out of the ground without having some sort of an environmental impact. And it's all, it, it's all about the balance, you know, it's about a grey area. It's about offsetting the fact that, you know, we are we have a massive carbon emitter at the moment. We're trying to do something about that. And we know to a much greater extent what the impact of that is for climate change. And on the flip side, 
yes, you are having to move a lot of earth potentially to get a lot of this lithium. Uh, to some extent, you're burning carbon as well. To some extent, you're going into quite pristine ecosystems, particularly in Chile, where you've got places like the Salar de Atacama, um, where there's fling flamingo populations, where no one's sure what's happening to the ecosystem when you pull out all of the brine and turn it into to this stuff. So there are, you know, there are going to be compromises. I mean, that, that is the interesting thing mm. to my mind. We, we shouldn't be blind to the fact that there are compromises. The point, though, is to say that the good offsets the bad. You know, the good of reducing carbon emissions, reducing all of the emissions that come out of a petrol engine car are kind of offsetting all of those damages that we might be doing. And it's also not as if carbon emissions is the only bad that comes from oil and gas. I mean, you know, you look at the areas of the world that have been despoiled by extracting this stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, just thousands, millions of acres. Extraordinary, just extraordinary. And uh, and we're still doing it. And that's that's the kind of slightly important thing to bear in mind. You know, we, we think we are weaning ourselves off this. No, we're just kind of slowing the race at which we're kind of getting it out of the ground to some extent. And we're still enormously reliant on it, not just to go into car engines, although that is, you know, the biggest chunk of, of, of reliance on crude oil. But it's also, it's making products, it's plastics, and there's a whole, you know, another kind of set of questions about what kind of damage we're doing through plastics. Talk to me about some of these other minerals you've got. Well, so, I mean, okay, talking about the energy transition, we're going to need a lot of copper. We can, actually, copper, in a way, even more important than lithium, because you need copper but not just for things like electric cars and for, uh, for, for the, the kind of contraptions we're using, but for the grid. You know, we're going to have massively more reliance on electricity, on power, uh, when, it, when we've got all those wind turbines. But to have those wind turbines, you need big tech cables with copper going through them. You need lots of copper motors. Uh, fat wires. Fat, fat wires, motors. incredibly thick, incredibly thick cables when you, when you see them. And so we need lots more of this stuff. This is called chalcopyrite. It's a, it's a copper ore that also comes from Chile, uh, has the world's biggest reserves in copper and of lithium. Um, and the issue here is that we need to basically double the amount of copper we're getting out of the ground if we are going to fulfill all of those promises we've wow. made. Uh, you've written a book uh, uh, about this. Uh, give me the title. Well, it's called Material World, and it's right. just it's trying to tell the, the world's story. It's, not, it's partly about net zero, but it's partly about a bit of our history. It's partly about the fact that we are reliant on these materials. So obviously lithium, we mentioned crude oil, copper. That's iron, by the way, so you know, steel is... is absolutely critical for the survival yeah. uh, of the world and indeed for our development that stuff's from brazil salt you know we kind of think that salt is just this kind of boring condiment you sprinkle on your chips and of course it is and it's great and i love salt but we use it for chemicals and they are incredibly important you know you've got salt that goes into chlorine purifying our drinking water without you know pure drinking water without salt we're in big trouble and then you can't really make stuff without salt because it provides these chemicals like caustic soda which enable you to take things like lithium and turn it into these powders that we can actually use and then finally sand you know silicon chips concrete um, all of those things um, glass for that matter these are the kind of materials that we built civilization on and so it's just you know it's a story about all of that stuff with all these things you're talking about you know greater exploitation um, is there a feeling that we can do this in a, in, in a better way? Is there a move to try and shrink the environmental impact within the industry? I think, you know, just need to be honest. There are no silver bullets here. It's going to be potentially a bit dirtier than we think it is going to be to get to net zero, but that shouldn't stop us from wanting to do it. We should just be open-eyed about it and understand the importance of these materials in the stuff that we're touching every day, because it all basically begins with this stuff. Ed Conway, thank you so much. Uh, we're off to a break now. When we come back, we'll be going to Glastonbury, amongst other places, where we'll be seeing how a wind turbine is helping to make sustainable samosas. Welcome back to the show. And you find me on the Isle of May, which is in the North Sea, just off the east coast of Scotland. And I'm here because we're filming something for next week all about puffins and robots, well actually artificial intelligence, but it's really relevant this place to something that's happening right now and that is what they're calling a category 4 extreme ocean heat wave. The waters around the UK, particularly here in the North Sea and on the west coast of Ireland, have seen a temperature rise near the surface of 4 to 5 degrees and that can really harm wildlife. And I'm going to have a talk about this right now with the guy who is the warden for this place and has been here for nine years. So he's really able to see the trends and changes in the waters around here. 
hot is bad, you know, the, the cold water, the upwellings, bringing the plankton and then the sand eels to the surface for all these seabirds to be feeding on. And of course, the temperatures of a sea at this moment in time, but here we are in mid-June, we don't normally see these temperatures until about mid-September. So already three months, three and a half months ahead of where we should be. That's not good. These birds can't adapt that quickly. Also in the news this week. The government has come under fire for removing a ban on opening new coal mines from the energy bill currently going through Parliament. That's despite coal use in the UK power mix being at record lows and facing a complete ban next year. The government says it wants to ensure security of supply for industries like steel, cement and heritage steam. The Church of England has announced that it's divesting from seven big oil and gas companies, including Shell, BP, Exxon and Total, after concluding that none of them were aligned with the Paris Agreement to limit warming. Shell itself drew criticism last week for pledging to further grow its gas business and not cut oil output. In February, BP also backtracked on plans to cut oil and gas production by 40% this decade. Last year, these companies saw record profits. They really have the chance to, to, um, to transition. They have the opportunity to really invest in the transition and, and show that they met the targets that they had set. And um, we've seen engagement. We wanted to bring them on board. We thought it would be better if they were on board. But after the last year, we just, we've lost faith in them and we just don't think that they're serious. New research has shown that using a gas hob can flood your home with levels of the cancer causing chemical benzene to levels worse than secondhand smoke or even for areas neighbouring oil and gas facilities. The researchers from Stanford University in California found that high levels remain in the home for up to six hours after the hob was used. It is Glastonbury this weekend and caring for the environment has always been central to the festival's ethos since its beginnings in 1970. This year is no different and Sky's Jason Manseray has got the tough beat of finding out all about it. Thanks Tom. Uh, hello and welcome to Glastonbury Festival. The sun is out and I'm enjoying a lovely falafel. Now the reason I'm eating that is because stores like this one, at least in part, are powered by this turbine here. Now it's from Octopus Energy and it's not just a sign of sustainability, they say it's to show how quickly it can be done. It was a month from ordering to installation. Now two people who can talk a little bit more about how this works and what it does uh, is the lovely Alexia and Luke from Glastonbury. Um, do you want to tell us first of all uh, how much energy is this actually providing? Uh, so our wind turbine that we've installed this year is a 45 kilowatt wind turbine and that can produce roughly around 300 kilowatt hours a day with the wind that we have coming up the valley. And that's equivalent to the same energy use as around 30 homes or 300 fridges for one day. That's a phenomenal amount of energy, but it's not the only source of energy that you're coming in here. It seems to be like a combination of different um, approaches you're taking. Yeah, sustainability has always been at the heart of Glastonbury Festival. Our green fields have always run on solar and wind power since their inception in the 1980s, and our dream has always been to implement that across the site. And this year, we're absolutely thrilled to be able to power the festival needs through fossil fuel free means. There's over 200,000 people that are coming to a rural area, to a farm, to eat, to consume, to drink, to go to the bathroom. There is an impact there though. Well, when you bring 200,000 people to a field in rural Somerset, they're always going to have challenges. But we're quite well set up for it now. And, and when they're here, they use less water than they would do at home because they're not showering as much. And all their waste is hand Hand shifted, hand sifted through our at our own recycling centre on site, so we can avoid sending any waste to landfill. So we're really pleased to be able to have that infrastructure in place. And very finally and very briefly, how long until you guys have like a zero impact whatsoever? Everything we've been doing at the festival for not only the last sort of couple of years, last 50 years, is, is an evolution. Every year we look at what have we done, what can we do a little bit better, and I think our ambition is to take our learnings from this year, do a little bit more next year. You know, so I don't want to put a time frame on it, but. We'll get there, you know, we're, we've already gone fossil fuel free and I think it's going to happen, you know, in the near future. Now the waters around me here in the Firth of Forth used to have huge oyster beds, some of which were the size of the nearby city of Edinburgh, but in a familiar story they were all fished out. Now a project going on in the Dornoch Firth, a little further north from here, shows the potential of reintroductions, not only for the oysters themselves, but for wider nature.
reason that oysters do enhance biodiversity is due to the structure they provide. So we've got live oyster shells, we've got dead oyster shells, and the matrix of them combined creates all these little cracks and nooks and crannies that are homes for other animals. put some oysters back into the system to show that they could still grow and survive. And then we've been optimizing that process of restoration. So basically, um, you know, working out how to re-establish re the habitat type, how to get the oysters in there and building up those populations over time. conservation orders that, that uh, restrict uh, the removal of, uh, of shellfish from the Dornoch Firth. So there's loads of bird life, uh, wading birds, ducks, geese, and there's lots of uh, seals that haul out on the sandbanks. Um, there's fish that migrate up, up the river through the estuary. Um, there's um, all sorts of sponges and, and, uh, and uh, shellfish on the seabed, so it's really quite rich already. Uh, but there's this missing link, the, the oysters that uh, haven't been there for over 100 years. hope that other restoration initiatives will take our example um, and I think in terms of industry partners the fact that we could have such a clear return um, as you know an output a consequence of restoration it makes the whole idea of it a lot more attractive to, um, to industry partners and to other conservation agencies. Now, before we go, just a reminder that you can catch up on all your environment and climate news on the Sky News website and app or by scanning the QR code that's on your screen right now. Next week, we'll be here, or actually a little offshore, looking at how the very latest tech, artificial intelligence, could help puffins. See you then. <laughs>